Never had that there choice. Never had that choice before. There okay. it is. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. This is Minette Kennedy with uh, Humanities Team and Evolution Revolution, and we are meeting for our weekly book group, reading books by Neil Donald Walsh. The book we are on right now, about to complete, is book two, Conversations with God, and. I would like to welcome everybody who's here, and when we have more people join in, we'll, we're going to do this a little bit differently today, um, where Linda feels like there might be a question or comment, or if somebody says, wait a minute, I would like to say something um, about what we just read instead of reading the whole chapter and then trying to discuss, and just see how that format works out, so... And I really appreciate you, Linda, for volunteering to do the reading. You're so, welcome. Are we ready? You can begin when you All like. Right. All right. So we're on chapter 20. And Neil starts, why do people doubt you? Because they doubt themselves. Well, why do they doubt themselves? Because they've been taught to, told to. By whom? people who claimed to be representing me. I don't get it. Why? Because it was a way. It is the only way to control people. You must doubt yourself, you see, or you would claim all your power. That would not do. That would not do at all. Not for the people who currently hold the power. They're holding the power, which is yours. And they know it. And the only way to hold on to it is to stave off the world's movement towards seeing and then solving the two biggest problems in human experience, which are, well, I've discussed them over and over again in this book. To summarize then, most, if not all, of the world's problems and conflicts and of your problems and conflicts as individuals would be solved and resolved if you would as a society one, abandon the concept of separation, and two, adopt the concept of visibility. Never see yourself again as separate from one another, and never see yourself as separate from me. Never tell anything but the whole truth to anyone, and never again accept anything less than your grandest truth about me. The first choice will produce the second. For when you see and understand what, that you are one with everyone, you cannot tell an untruth or withhold important data or be anything but totally visible, visible with all others because you will be clear that it is in your own best interests to do so. But this paradigm shift will take great wisdom, great courage, and massive determination. For fear will strike at the heart of, those, of these concepts and call them false. Fear will eat at the core of these magnificent truths and make them appear hollow. Fear will distort, disdain, destroy. And so fear will be your greatest enemy. Yet, you will not have, cannot produce, the society for which you have always yearned and of which you have always dreamed, unless and until you see with wisdom and clarity the ultimate truth, that what you do to others, you do to yourself. What you fail to do for others, you fail to do for yourself. That the pain of others is your pain, and the joy of others is your joy, and that when you disclaim any part of it, you disclaim a part of yourself. Now is the time to reclaim yourself. Now is the time to see yourself again as who you really are, and thus render yourself visible again. For when you and your true relationship with God becomes visible, then we are indivisible, and nothing will ever divide us again. 
And although you will live again in the illusion of separation, using it as a tool to create yourself anew, you will henceforth move through your incarnations with enlightenment, seeing the illusion for what it is, using it playfully and joyfully to experience any aspect of who we are, which it pleases you to experience, yet never more accepting it as reality. You will never more have to use the device of forgetfulness in order to recreate yourself anew, but will use separation knowingly, simply choosing to manifest as that which is separate for a particular reason and for a particular purpose. And then you are thus totally enlightened. That is, once more filled with the light. You may even choose as your particular reason for returning to physical life the reminding of others. You may select to return to this physical life not to create and experience any new aspect of yourself, but to bring the light of truth to this, of the, to this place of illusion the others may see, that others may see. When you will be a bringer of the light, then you will be a part of the awakening. The awakening. There are others who have already done this. They've come here to help us to know who we are? Yes. They are enlightened souls, souls which have evolved. They no longer seek the next higher experience for themselves. They've already had the highest experience. They desire now only to bring news of that experience to you. They bring you the good news. They will show you the way and the life of God. They will say, I am the way and the life, follow me. Then they will model for you what it is like to live in the everlasting glory of conscious union with God, which is called God consciousness. We are always united, you and I. We cannot not be. It is simply impossible. Yet you live now in the unconscious experience of that unification. It's also possible to live in the physical body in conscious union with all that is, in conscious awareness of ultimate truth, in conscious expression of who you really are, when you do this, you serve as a model for all others, others who are living in forgetfulness. You become a living reminder. And in this, you save others from becoming permanently lost in their forgetfulness. That is hell, to become lost permanently in forgetfulness. Yet I will not allow it. I will not allow a single sheep to be lost, but will send a shepherd. Indeed, many shepherds I will send, and you may choose to be one of them. And when souls are awakened by you from their slumber, re-reminded once again of who they are, all the angels in heaven rejoice for these souls. For once they, are lo they were lost, and now they are found. There are people, holy beings, like this right now on our planet. Is that not right? Not just in the past, but right now? Yes, always there have been. Always there will be. I will not leave you without teachers. I will not abandon the flock, but always send after it, my shepherds. And there are many on your planet right now, and in other parts of the universe as well. And in some parts of the universe, these beings live together in constant communion and in constant expression of the highest truth. These are the enlightened societies of which I have spoken. They exist. They are real. And they have sent you their emissaries. You mean Buddha, Krishna, Jesus were spacemen? You said that. I didn't. Is it true? Is this the first time you've ever thought that? No, but is it true? 
do you believe these masters existed somewhere before they came to earth and returned to that place after their so-called death? Yes, I do. And where do you suppose that place is? Well, I always thought that it was what we call heaven. I thought they came from heaven. And where do you suppose heaven is? Well, I, I don't know. In another realm, I guess. Another world? Yes. Oh, oh, I see. But I would have called it in the spirit world, not another world as we know it, not another planet. It is the spirit world. Yet what makes you think those spirits, those holy spirits, cannot or would not choose to live somewhere else in the universe, just as they did when they came to your world? Well, I suppose I just never thought of it that way. It's not been a part of my ideas about all of this. Well, this is a quote. There's more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Your wonderful metaphysician, William Shakespeare, wrote that. Then Jesus was a spaceman. I didn't say that. Well, was he or wasn't he? <laughs> Patience, my child, you jump ahead too much. There is more, so much more. We have a whole nother book to write. You mean I have to wait for book three? I told you. I promised you from the beginning. There will be three books, I said. The first would deal with individual life and truths and challenges. The second would discuss truths of life as a family on this planet. And the third, I said, would cover the largest truths having to do with the eternal questions. In this will be revealed the secrets of the universe. Unless they're not. Oh, man, I don't know how much more of this I can take. I mean, really, I am tired of living in the contradiction, as you always put it. I want what's so to be so. Then so it shall be. Unless it's not. That's it. That's it. You've got it. Now you understand the divine dichotomy. Now you see the whole picture. Now you comprehend the plan. Everything, everything that ever was, is now and ever will be, exists right now. And so all that is, is. Yet all that is, is constantly changing. For life is an ongoing process of creation. Therefore, in the very real sense, that which is, is not. The isness is never the same which means the isness is not. Well, excuse me, Charlie Brown, but good grief. How can anything mean anything then? It doesn't. But you're jumping ahead again. All of this in good time, my son. All of this in good time. These and other larger mysteries will all be understood after reading book three. Unless, altogether now, unless they're not, precisely. Okay, okay, fair enough. But between now and then, or for that matter, for the people who may never get to read these books, what avenues can be used right here, right now, to get back to wisdom, to get back to clarity, to get back to God? Do we need to return to religion? Is that the missing link? Return to spirituality. Forget about religion. Well, that statement's going to anger a lot of people. People will react to this entire book with anger, unless they do not. Why do you say, forget religion? Because it's not good for you. Understand that in order for organized religion to succeed, it has to make people believe they need it. In order for people to put faith in something else, they must first lose faith in themselves. So the first task of organized religion is to make you lose your faith in yourself. The second task is to make you see that it has the answers that you do not. And the third and most important task is to make you accept the answers without question. If you question, you start to think. You start to go back to that source within. Religion can't have you do that because you're liable to come up with an answer different than what is contrived. So religion must make you doubt yourself, 
must make you doubt your own ability to think straight. The problem for religion is that very often this backfires. For if you cannot accept without doubt your own thoughts, how can you not doubt the new thoughts about God which the religion has given you? Pretty soon, you even doubt my existence, which ironically, you never doubted before. When you were living by your intuitive knowing, you may not have had me all figured out, but you definitely knew I was there. It is religion which has created agnostics. Any clear thinker who looks at what religion has done must assume religion has no God, for it is religion which has filled the hearts of men with fear of God, where, man, when, when, where once man loved that which is in all its splendor. It is religion which has ordered men to bow down before God, where once man rose up in joyful outreach. It is religion which has burdened man with worries about God's wrath, where once man sought God to lighten his burden. It is religion which told man to be ashamed of his body and its most natural functions, where once man celebrated those functions as the greatest gifts of life. It is religion that taught you that you must have an intermediary in order to reach God, where once you thought yourself to be reaching God by the simple living of your life in goodness and in truth. And it is religion which commanded humans to adore God, where once humans adored God because it was impossible not to. Everywhere religion has gone, it has created disunity, which is the opposite of God. Religion has separated man from God and man from man, man from woman. Some religions actually telling man that he's above women even as it claims God is above man, thus setting the stage for the greatest travesties ever foisted upon half of the human race. I tell you this, God is not above man, and man is not above woman. That is not the natural order of things, but it is the way everyone who had power, namely men, wished it was when they formed their male worship religions, systematically editing out half the material from their final version of the Holy Scriptures and twisting the rest of it to fit the mold of their male model of the world. It is religion which insists to this very day that women are somehow less, somehow second-class spiritual citizens, somehow not suited to teach the Word of God, preach the Word of God, or minister to the people. Like children, you're still arguing over which gender is ordained by me to be my priests. I tell you this, you're all priests, every single one of you. There is no one person or class of people more suited to do my work than any other. But so many of your men are just like your nations, power hungry. They do not like to share power, merely exercise it and they have constructed the same kind of God, a power-hungry God, a God that does not like to share power, but merely exercise it. Yet I tell you this, God's greatest gift is the sharing of God's power, and I would have you be like me. So this is over with the o'clock. But can we, basically, can you come back and agree on what's this? Okay. Was that a question or? Somebody just joined the call. Oh, okay. So keep going. Does anybody have any questions that they want to bring up at this moment? If you go into um, participants, I think, you can raise your hand. Or you can raise your hand if you're on camera. Okay. And we're, what page are we on, Linda? Oh, you uh, don't have pages, do you? 
No, because I'm on a PDF. Um, does anybody else two, have? Four, two, four, eight in the book, in the paperback. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, so Neil continues, but we cannot be like you. That would be blasphemy. Well, the blasphemy is that you've been taught such things. I tell you this. You have been made in the image and likeness of God. It is that destiny you came to fulfill. You did not come here to strive and to struggle and to never get there, nor did I send you on a mission impossible to complete. Believe in the goodness of God and believe in the goodness of God's creation, namely your holy selves. So you said something earlier in this book which intrigued me. I'd like to go back as we come to the end of this volume. You said absolute power demands absolutely nothing. Is this the nature of God? Now you have understood. As I have said, God is everything, and God becomes everything. There is nothing which God is not, and all that God is is experiencing of itself God is experiencing in as and through you in my purest form I am absolute I am absolutely everything and therefore I need want and demand absolutely nothing from this absolutely pure form I am as you make me it is as if you were finally to see God and say well what do you make of that? Yet no matter what you make of me, I cannot forget and will always turn up to my purest form. All the rest is fiction. It is something you're making up. There are those who would make me a jealous God. But who could be jealous when one has and is everything? There are those who would make me a wrathful God. But what would cause me to be angry when I cannot be hurt or damaged in any way. There are those who would make me a vengeful God. But on whom would I take vengeance, since all that exists is me? And why would I punish myself for simply creating? If you th or if you must think of us as separate, why would I create you, give you the power to create, give you the freedom of choice to create what you wish to experience, and then punish you forever for making wrong choices. I tell you this, I would not do such a thing. And in that truth lies your freedom from the tyranny of God. In truth, there is no tyranny except in your imagination. You may come home whenever you wish. We can come together again and again whenever you want. The ecstasy of your union with me is yours to know again at the drop of a hat at the feel of the wind on your face at the sound of a cricket under diamond skies on a summer night at the first sight of a rainbow and the first cry of a newborn babe and at the last ray of a spectacular sunlight and the last breath in a spectacular life I am with you always unto the end of time your union with me is complete it always was always is and always will be you and i are one both now and even forevermore go now and make of your life a statement of this truth Cause your days and nights to be the reflections of the highest idea within you. Allow your moments of now to be filled with the spectacular ecstasy of God made manifest through you. Do it through the expression of your love, eternal and unconditional, for all those whose lives you touch. Be a light unto the darkness and curse it not be a bringer of the light you are that so be it thank you and let's see i've got a hand up or something in the chat room 
Oh, Sarah says, and I agree with you. Beautifully read, Linda. Thank you. Um, it you definitely make these pages come alive. Um, one of the things. Let's see. I wanted to talk about was it's the second page into chapter 20 in my book but I've got different page numbers the paragraph says but this paradigm shift will take great wisdom great courage and massive determination for fear will strike at the heart of the these concepts and call them false fear will eat at the core of these magnificent truths and make them appear hollow fear will distort disdain destroy and so fear will be your greatest enemy. And I com completely agree with what God is saying here. Because fear of anything, it, it's not good for me because it puts me in that worry place. And in the worry place is like a post I put up the other day that says worrying is like, sitting in a wheelchair or not a wheelchair but a rocking chair and expecting to get somewhere when you're just in the same place and i know we've talked a lot about politics of present day right now but i think this fear can go beyond politics it can go into um the middle east which is politics but it's not the u.s politics although the u.s takes part not in ISIS, but, um, and we have, you know, these things that are going on in um, Turkey, um, and it's hard not to go to fear, because I, I fear things like, boy, I hope we aren't going to get, have another war, or I hope we're not going to, you know, if anybody just wants to speak to that, because I, I have a bad habit of jumping to the side of the grave over. Oh, let me unmute Diane. Or we'll see. How can, there we go. Okay. Uh, this paragraph also strike me, but in the smallest thing as well, even though you're absolutely right, thinking about what's going on in the planet. And it's kind of synchronicity because just before the meeting, I was taking notes for the small report that Christine had asked the country coordinator for the global uh, meeting. And I was, uh, since we started, last year, middle of the year, working on the Facebook. And I was just thinking about that. All the messages that work best is when I choose a good quote of the Neil's book and find a good image and put a little money on it. But there are also the quote, the quotes which Brian brings me angry commentaries because God never said that. And I have been very soft until now. <laughs> I didn't at all enter in the more controversial one. I'm just going slowly. I did a new one this morning. I'll see what will be done. And I say, God says. I start with that. And, uh, and when we came to that paragraph, I felt we were just exactly talking about that. All the message of the books get deep to many people and all they scare others because it move it rocks the boat. It's not what the religions have said, and it's not was where we all have taken comfort in the past. And um, this fear is also in our, our lives. When we don't trust, we're afraid of what we have to do. Uh, I just put a very strong limit to my son. I try to do it, do it not harshly, 
but it is was very strong. I know I had to do it, but I've been feeling bad for the last two days because I'm afraid that I it was not the right decision and I'm afraid I'm not uh, putting love in the world and that that would have bad effects. We are living with fear all the time. Complete. Off mute. Thank you, Diane. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think every one of us who's got children or nieces and nephews or whatever I, I don't think there's a parent on the planet who hasn't felt the way you were just describing Diane um, and I think one of the hardest things to do because we love our children so very much I mean that's just it that sometimes it's hard to say things the right way, um, especially if they're not well planned out. And oftentimes when I'm getting ready to reprimand, I'm not thinking it well out. I'm, I'm like, I've told you once, I've told you twice, you know. Um, and, and I know that sometimes, my, and my youngest son is 22, and he still lives at home, and I know sometimes I just bug the you know what out of him. But um, as God says throughout the books we've read so far, we are perfect. And if we can kind of remember what God said somewhere here that I don't have marked, you can't damage me, you can't diminish me, you can't, you know, you can't, I can't be hurt. Now, I've got a long ways to go on that because I can still be hurt, you know. I mean, if somebody were to say something that hurt my feelings, I would have hurt feelings. I'm, I've not gained that level yet. But I'm glad you brought that up. Over. What um, I liked was um, interested in this chapter was about um, enlightened societies and just to get my head around where they are and who, what they are, who they are, <laughs> and where they are. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. It's not the US at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Or highly evolved beings, isn't it? H-E-Bs. Yeah, HEBs. Um, I think, and I am not remembering where I'm remembering this from. <laughs> That's good. Um, but I think they're walking all around us all the time. And it's whether we choose to, um, it, something I do is I attach meaning to most of, what I'm cognizant of. Now, I don't do it 24-7 or I wouldn't get anything done. But, like, if I'm at the grocery store and I see that, I've used this example again and again, but, like, I saw a young college kid one time do that fatal mistake of pulling a lemon out of a stack towards the bottom, and the lemons went everywhere. And he was so embarrassed I thought he was going to crawl out of the store. And I was like, hey, we've all done it, been there, done that. And I said, I'll just help you pick them back up. And then somebody else started helping pick things up. And I think it's when you see those kinds of actions, and it may seem insignificant. I think that's where that college kid probably walked away, probably not having a spiritual experience unless he did, as Neil says. Um, but I think you probably walked away feeling, you know, that wasn't that big a deal. Um, you know, at first it was, but, um, I also think, um, the, 
there's a story for any of you who've ever studied mythology. Um, there's a story about where Zeus is walking amongst the people. He's dressed as a normal person. He came down from Olympus and was just trying to get a, a pulse on what, you know, people were doing that were good, was good and kind. And But he dressed himself kind of poorly. And he went to many doors and knocked and said, could I have something to drink and something to eat? And he kept getting the door shut in his face. And then finally he was at the top of this hill or near the top. And he knocked on a door and said, could I get something to eat, something to drink? And this elderly couple opened the door and said, come on in. We'll give you some soup and bread and water or wine, whatever it was they were drinking. And when the meal was complete, Zeus revealed himself as Zeus. And of course, this older couple was blown out of the water. And he said, you have shown me kindness when you did not know who I was. And for that, um, you can have any wish you'd like to have. And the couple said that they wanted to, because they were elderly, that when their time came to transition, they wanted to be sitting on the top of the hill watching a sunset, and they both wanted to go at the same time so that one wouldn't have to mourn the other. And then Zeus said, and once you do pass, I will plant two olive trees, and they will intertwine and be there for everybody to see. And I sometimes think in our crazy world of today, though I don't think, I believe God and the angels are walking amongst us the higher evolved beings. And once we lose sight of that, which I don't have that down to a fine art either, because there's certain individuals that shall remain nameless that I don't want to meet face to face. But you know what? I could be missing the opportunity to have a conversation with God just to see how I treated that person. Um, anyway, I'm rambling. If anybody else wants to add okay I'll ramble some more um, and in that conversation that we were just having or I was just having um, Neil says they have come here to help us know who we are. And God says, yes, they are enlightened souls. And so I guess we have to just keep in mind that anybody we walk into could be that enlightened soul. So let me give the mic to Diane, if I can. Okay. There you go, Diane. Whoops, you're not unmuted yet. Oh, how can this be so difficult? On mute. Okay, there you go, Diane. Well, I just wanted to say that in addition of the, uh, the difficulties we've mentioned, how, be how beautiful is that chapter? And uh, it just feels good to, to listen to, to God express herself so deeply without uh, entering in a controversy or explanation with Neil, uh, well, at the beginning, but after that. And uh, the last answer, the, the last answer is so, so very nourishing. And uh, I want you to, to say it. And in addition to treat well enlightened person, beings, it's remembering that it is also 
our uh, destiny. And he finished like that when he, she, be a light unto the darkness and curse it not. Curse not the, the, the darkness. We are being near of the light. You are that, so be it. And if we could welcome this message, that would be enough. We don't need nothing more than that. It's just that we are, we forget, we're fearful, we're stubborn, stubborn everyone around us as well. And we need a constant reminder. But I just wanted to say how beautiful is that chapter and it's a beautiful way to finish book two. Incomplete. Yeah, I agree. And <clears throat> when you're talking about creating quotes, I've marked a couple of things that I'll be posting on the worldwide Facebook page for Humanities Team because I think there's a lot of jewels in here. And um, I just wanted to mention that uh, where Neil says, why do you say forget religion? He says, because it, God says it is not good for you. Understand that in order for organized religion to succeed, it has to make people believe they need it. In order for people to put faith in something else, they must first lose faith in themselves. Now, probably I'm not the only one on the call, but I was raised a Catholic, and they do a pretty good job of... Uh, making you lose faith in yourself. Um, now, I didn't have the a horrific Catholic education, um, but I know many who have. And I've told this story that some of you probably heard before, but when I was, I think I was in the second grade with Sister Frances Margaret, and we were talking about Adam and Eve and how they were the first two people on earth. And, and believe me, you, I knew not a drip or a drop about sex or how, where babies came from. But after she explained that Adam and Eve were the first two people, and then I didn't even realize this at the time that they were all boys, but my little wheels were turning in my head going, because I thought you had to get married in order to have a child. It just happened willy-nilly. And so after that or, uh, discussion was had, I walked up very quietly to Sister Frances Margaret's desk, because we were in quiet time now, and I said, I just need to understand this. If Adam and Eve are the first two people on the planet, and you have to get married and well th they had sons no those would be the next people on the planet i, I didn't mention sons because i didn't get that part but their children i said so their children have to marry each other in order for other people to come along and she looked at me and she always called me mary marie nanette my name was marie nanette not mary marie mary marie nanette you just have to have faith and I thought, what the heck does that mean? And it implied, it implied to me that I don't have faith because I was, having, was asking this question. Um, but I, I do think what God says about organized religion is right on. Over. I agree. I've always agreed. I agree too. One of the things that I did when I was a kid, my mother, my mother was too smart for religion. And so she was always like trying to find ways to dispute what they were telling. And so she, she wasn't a believer, but she wanted me to come to my own decision. So she would drag me around to these different churches. And um, I was a preteen 
when I decided I was going to figure it out for myself. And I pretty much just um, made it a mission. To, I started with one religion. I think it was Episcopalian because that was where we were going at the time. And I traced it all the way back to its inception. And then I went to the next one and I did the same thing. And then I picked some others that I didn't even, had never been exposed to. And I did the same thing like Hindu and um, it, it doesn't, what you discover is if you do that exercise, it doesn't matter. You can start with any religion. And if you take it back all the way to its root, its true root, you end up in the exact same place at the exact same four letters of. That's where it starts. And from there, people try to disempower each other by removing the love, removing the truth, and turning it into some kind of a power thing. And that's, that's why I'm just so on board with this, because I know for a fact that the true point of any religion when it started was love. That's where it started. And they're all corrupt at this point. Every single one of them lost their way. I would also add to what you said, Linda, is I've noticed, now I live in a college town of, I don't know, almost 100,000 people. I notice when I'm driving around that a lot of these smaller churches, whether they're Lutheran or Unity or Episcopal or Catholic or the synagogue that's in town, that I see a lot more inclusiveness kind of things in their um, they're not billboards but things that they can put sayings up on and many of them say things like we don't care what color you are we don't care what your sexual whatever is all are welcome here um, and there's one in the summertime that's not too far from my house that'll say Come dressed, as, come dressed as Moses, wear your Birkenstocks. We don't need you to dress up, you know. Um, but it just seems like there's this lighter tone because I think organized religion is feeling a lot of people saying, uh-uh, you know, I'm, I, can't, I can't go there. Um, and I, w I was probably in my teens when I went to a Holy Thursday Mass and it's where the congregation reads the part of the bad people saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And I f felt so horrible in, in playing that role, even in a church setting, that I shut up and I said, I will never, ever, I wouldn't have been one of those people. I would have never stood by and said, crucify him. Um, I would have died on a another cross, you know, because and it wouldn't be just because it was Jesus Christ. It's because I don't like to see people in pain. Over. Well, I think, you know, that crucify, crucify call isn't all that different from lock her up, lock her up. That we're seeing nowadays. I mean, that wasn't a religious cry, but it's the same division. It's the same lack of realization that we're all one. It's like when Mike Pence went to that show, the Hamilton show, and the people in the audience booed him. It's a perfect teaching example because you're booing yourself. If we're one, then as hard as that is to stomach, We've got to get to the place where we realize that when we're name calling, when we're booing somebody, when we're chanting lock them up or prosecute or whatever, we're asking that that be done to us because that person is us. There's no, you know, that's, God doesn't talk about it in this term, but this whole third dimension is an illusion. And, and it allows us to take on these roles of 
individual beings and experience life the way we want it, which he talks about in this chapter. But it also allows us to forget the fact that we're completely connected to everything else that exists. And so the biggest takeaway from this chapter, I think, is, is that we have to find that place within us where we can connect to the most vile person we can think of because they're not separate from us. God is in them too. They're God's creation and they are God in manifestation and they may not be acting godly, but they're no different from us. And so n finding the way to nurture love in spite of appearances is, I think, the biggest takeaway from this chapter. It's the most important piece. And then the other thing that I just want to share is that I, as much as uh, no one wants to hear this, I think that this situation that the United States finds itself in right now is the revelation that we have two very distinct beliefs in this country. There is a group of people that stand by our Constitution and believe that we are all created one and that we all have inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that we should be able to do that without a religion being crammed down our throat. And then there's a whole other faction now that they got their Bible in one hand, they got their cross in the other, and, they're, and in fact, the guy that they're interviewing for attorney general just went on the record as saying he believes the division between church and state is unconstitutional. So we're, we're in a place now where within the United States, we can no longer ignore what religion has done to divide us. And we either have to become light workers unlike anything the planet's seen so that we can somehow help this awaken and reach the people that have a cross in one hand and a Bible in the other. Or we need to, with love in our hearts, say, I love you. I allow you, and some states will become this and others will become that, and we are no longer 50 United States. That's what's facing us right now as a nation, and I think it's directly talked about in this chapter. I do too, and you know, as a bigger historical example of this and I think it's in book one I'm pretty I'm positive it's in book one I remember where it, God says in Hitler's in heaven or whatever he said and I was like what <laughs> you know it's like and I thought about what I was reading and it can't be God is all loving and all forgiving except for when your name is Adolf Hitler right um, and it took me a while to wrap my head around that because it just seemed so sacrilegious and you know but I'm telling you once I could wrap my head around that which is a pretty big thing I could better understand everything else God was saying in the books that I've read and it just means it's you know it, it it's just is it's all-encompassing. It is. And you can't have these caveats of saying, except for when. Well, um, I think we'll wrap it up unless somebody has a last thing they'd like to say. I just have a question about how we want to do next week because there is still um, 
I mean, the chapter ended, but now there's uh, in closing, which we didn't read. So are, are we going to want to read that next week, or will we want to start right up with? I think we should do the in closing. What does everybody else think? I don't have it in my edition. I have a compound of three books, but that's fine with me. It's it's really short, so it wouldn't be, I mean, it's like four or five pages long. But I didn't even mention it because I wasn't sure it was in other people's books. Right. I have no idea. That's why I was asking. Um, it certainly can't hurt us. Sarah says that she would like to do it. Okay. Okay. So let's okay, plan so. on that. And then I have... I have chat or chapter. I've got book three in my double book here. Um, is anybody going to need some time? I don't know if book three is online, which it is. Okay. I downloaded it this morning. Okay. Um, well, I think what we can do is go ahead and read the closing of book two and when I advertise or promote next week's call I will add in there that um, we're going to be beginning we're going to finish this in closing of chapter 20 book two and we're going to begin book three for anybody who's interested so but I every time I learn something new from you from the book um, sometimes I, I re remember something from my own, from myself when I'm talking, I'll go, huh, haven't thought that for a while. Um, but I just want everybody to know how much I enjoy it. And I see that Shabana just joined us, but Shabana, it's the end of the phone call. <laughs> um, which she's just going to have to listen to the recording. Um, anyway, does anybody else? I'm sure I'll see most of you Facebook, emails, and meetings. Diane, you know what those are like. Um, so, all right, everybody, I love you. Thank you. Love you, too. Have a good week. Thanks, Linda, for this beautiful reading. Thanks again. Yes, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you, Brenna. Hi. Sorry, I was late. That's okay. <laughs> Love you guys. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.